Good day, family, and welcome or welcome back to the best channel on YouTube and narrated by your boy, Dave Chappelle. Nah, I'm just kidding, but welcome to my channel, The Mysterious Black Bandit. On my last video, I asked you guys to rep your city and state, but due to the content I produced, YouTube disabled my comment section and didn't allow it. But they shouldn't do it on this one, so if you guys don't mind, when you comment, let your boy know where you're from. Okay, now on this video, I'm gonna try my best not to sound like Dave Chappelle, but if I do, I apologize in advance. All right, go ahead and do your boy a solid and hit that like and subscribe button and please turn that notification bell on to receive all new content as soon as I upload. Now, let's jump into this up. In today's video, we'll be talking about the most notorious pimp of all times, a pimp named Slickback. Nah, I'm just kidding. This video will be about Robert Beck, AKA Iceberg Slim. Robert Beck was born on August 4, 1918 in Chicago, Illinois to his father Robert Moppins or Mopins and his mother Mary Brown. Robert and Mary met in Nashville, Tennessee where they got married, but just like most southern states at that time, it was hard for black people to find decent paying jobs, so they decided to move to Chicago to pursue a better life for themselves. But they soon realized Chicago wasn't the promised land they thought it would be with all the over policing of their neighborhoods. Despite that, Robert's parents eventually found work at a downtown hotel kitchen, but due to his father spending most of his money on gambling, they couldn't save any money nor pay their rent on their small apartment located in South LaSalle Street. When Iceberg was just a few months old, his father suggested to his mother that they leave him on a church doorstep, but she immediately refused. And of course, shortly after this, his mother and father divorced, and she left to try to find a better life for herself and her baby. Now, it was stated that for a few months, baby Iceberg and his mother moved around from city to city to find a place to stay and find work wherever she could. She cooked and sold for white families and did hair on top of that. Report stated that she went door to door with her hair utensils in one arm and him wrapped in a blanket in the other. And when someone opened the door, she would remove the blankets from his little baby face and say, I can make your hair curly and beautiful. Please give me a chance. For 50 cents, I can make your hair shine like new money. Now they struggled for a while, but she always found a way to feed them. After a short period that went by, she did find a steady job and she had to leave him with a babysitter. Robert had a pretty good childhood, especially when his mother got married to a man named Henry Upshaw. Henry was the owner of a royal cleaning and pressing shop in Rockford, Illinois, where they did repairs and altered female and male clothing, and later owning a laundromat, which was the only black owned business downtown. As you can imagine, Henry was a well-respected man in the community. And once Henry and his mother was married, he moved them into his home near downtown Rockford. And for years, Robert and his mother lived the most peaceful life. After they were married for a while, his mother even became president and chairman of many clubs and even became a leader in the church. Iceberg stated that Henry was the only person he truly loved. He treated his mother like a princess, giving her anything she wanted, and allowed him to work in his pressing shop during the summers and also put him in Boy Scout. In 1930, Iceberg transferred to Roosevelt Junior High and it was stated that he had a reputation at the school for being the most intelligent and charming kid that did very well in school was amongst the 13 best male spellers in 7th and 8th grade classes at the semifinals inter-school spelling test. During this time, Robert started to visit his father who had become a chef for the mayor, Bill Thompson, but on one occasion he stated that while he was there, his father started preparing a meal for his guests and the mayor walked in the room intoxicated and shouted, why is my food late, and shoved him. And of course his father didn't take this too well, so he screamed out, don't you ever put your hands on me, you SOB. And he also made some other comments that I won't say. Afterwards, the mayor laughed and retreated into the kitchen without saying a word. Now back at home, Henry was continuing to bless his mother with different gifts and also helped her open up her own beauty salon right in the middle of the black area. And from the start, her business flourished. All the hustlers from the red light district were her main customers because they had money to spend on their appearances and they flooded her business. Iceberg became mesmerized by the sight of these flashy clothes, jewelry, and women. And he stated from that point on, he decided he wanted to be a pimp. Now in the fall of 1931, Iceberg said his mother made a horrible decision that motivated him even more to become a pimp is when she fell for a smooth talking hustler named Steve. On September 15, 1931, she decided to leave Henry and follow Steve to Milwaukee. So she withdrew him from school and went to Henry's house and packed all her belongings. But as she was packing and trying to leave the house, Henry fell to his knees crying and pleading for them not to leave, but his mother had her mind set. She told him, I just need a little time, I promise you I'll be back, but Henry knew that was a lie. Once they got to Milwaukee, Iceberg turned to the streets for education instead of school, calling it street poison. Now for a year or so, they were right back where they started, 
They rented a house with Steve and she was back to working. And on one day, Steve was at home alone with him and went out and got intoxicated and gambled away all their furniture. He also used to threaten Iceberg frequently. His mother continued to ignore the signs for a while, but one day they got into an altercation and he punched her so hard he broke her jaw. And she had to be rushed to the hospital, but after that, he disappeared. During this time, the country was going through a great depression. So in order for them to survive, his mother had to work long hours at her job. And while she was working, he wanted the streets. He was in his teen years, so he started hanging out at the pool halls and the alleys with the pimps and the hustlers, and shortly began to learn how to play crap while learning their clever slangs. After a while, he became close with his first mentor of the game, Joe Party Time Evans. Joe was a small time con artist that would teach him the rule of his world. He said that Party Time usually skimmed the white men who came to their neighborhood looking to find prostitutes. He said Party Time would use reverse psychology on the white people by telling them the brothel was only for high class white men. No blacks or poor whites were allowed. This place is mostly filled by doctors, lawyers, and big time politicians. And of course this messed with their ego. And as they were getting ready to enter the house, he would tell them that the prostitutes are thieves. He need to leave all his valuables in his possession. Then he'll pull out this professional looking envelope and put all his stuff in that. And as soon as the white guy starts to walk up, he will disappear into the street. Now as Iceberg and Party Time became closer, they started to work together doing stunts like having Iceberg dress up like a female and wear a wig. Then he would stand at the end of an alley and Joe would steer any customer his way after he got the money. And once the customer got close, they both would disappear into the night. During Iceberg's adolescent years, he said that he started to become reckless and violent and eventually getting arrested several times from charges that range from larceny to immoral conduct. But he always talked himself out of being locked up. After a while, Iceberg decided to go back to school at Lincoln High School in Milwaukee, but he was too far gone. The streets had him locked in. In May of 1935, he was arrested for sexual misconduct and was found guilty. The judge gave him a choice. He could either be committed to an industrial school for boys, go to a reform school, or get a hard labor job. He decided to take the job and spent seven years digging ditches and planting trees. Once he got out of the manual labor job, his mother wanted to send him away so he could try to make something out of himself. After speaking with a few of her church members, she got him sent to an HBCU in Alabama called Tuskegee Institution. Once he arrived, he stated that he felt like college was too strict and started skipping class and seducing young women and hitting the juke joint. He was only there for 90 days and was expelled for bootlegging whiskey and gambling. And by December of 1936, he was on a train back to Milwaukee. Between the years of 1937 and 1942, he was arrested several more times. He tried to plan a heist on a jewelry store with the guy he used to work with, but that guy was the brother of a police officer. So once they got to the store, the police was waiting on him, and he ended up getting three years of probation. During this time, Iceberg came into contact with an older married woman named Pepper Evett, who would change his life for good. She was considered a street veteran that taught him all the sexual tricks in that industry, and he learned that he could use sex as a weapon of control. After a while, he finally realized what was going on and decided not to let Pepper use him anymore because it was breaking the pimping code. One day, he asked her for money to buy a new suit, but she refused, so he reached back and smacked her right in the face. Seconds after she recovered, she started fighting him back and managed to bite a plug in his navel. After this incident, he was arrested again, trying to blackmail her, and was sent to Wisconsin State Reformatory for two years. He stated that the reformatory was like a shiny, clean apple that was rotten to the core. The food was barely edible and riddled with worms. As he was laying in his bed one day, he noticed that there were an army of bed bugs crawling all over the wall and on his bed. And he witnessed another inmate looking at a prison guard the wrong way, and the guard knocked him across the head with a wooden cane, splitting his head wide open, then sending him to the hole. In 1939, he was released early for good behavior and was sent to live with his mother. At first, he tried to stay out of trouble, but he was too eager to try out what he had learned from the older pimps and hustlers who he met in jail. But he didn't have any money or clothes to get the older females to work for him, so he started to target the younger and inexperienced females. By the time he was 21, his manipulation and pimping game was on another level, especially for his age. He would ask his girls, do you love me enough to do anything for me? And once they responded yes, he knew he had her, but he eventually got caught. What happened is, he invited a guy up to the room with her, but the guy turned out to be friends of the little girl's father. He went back and told the father, and he had the police come and arrest him. Due to violating his probation and having a sex charge, he was sent to the Wisconsin State Prison. Iceberg felt that the reason he kept getting caught was because he was in a small town. So in 1942, once he got out of prison, he found what they would call a ride or die female and headed to Chicago. 
stacked all the knowledge and books he read while he was incarcerated, he was determined to be the world's most notorious pimp ever seen. Once he was there, he started making rounds throughout the area, picking up any female that he could, but most of them didn't stay long. When he met Albert Baby Bell, things started to change. Albert was an enforcer and also known for his violence while pimping. His main philosophy was, you need to get whatever you can out the female because there is no guarantee you're going to keep her for long. And on top of that, he was a firm believer of psychological manipulation. He told Iceberg that he needed to drive a few hours away and send money back to himself using another female's name. He said that this would show the females that they had competition and make them work harder in the streets. Iceberg was getting nods from every place he could. During the next five years, Iceberg was the new top pimp of Southside Chicago. It was estimated that he had gained and lost 60 to 70 women, but this didn't last long at all. Robert messed up and sent his bottom female, Phyllis, to Wisconsin to work a military camp, but this would be a huge mistake. When she returned home, she confronted Iceberg and challenged him in front of all the other females. And of course, this was blatant disrespect to a pimp, and he lost control and punched her so hard in the face, he broke her jaw. Once she got out of the hospital, her and another one of the girls went straight to the police and testified against him. And for months, Iceberg had to evade the police, but he kept the other girls working from a rundown building on the south side of Chicago. But on August 25th, 1944, he was spotted and arrested after he left his apartment to go buy heroin. He was sentenced to eight months in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. Once he was released, everything he put together on the street had started to deteriorate, so he had to start from scratch. All he had to his name was a little over $18 and the clothes on his back. So he made the decision to start robbing people. But since he wasn't too experienced in that, he was quickly arrested again and sent to Chicago House of Corrections. But this time, he stated that he couldn't stay in jail after just being released from Levensworth. So he set up a dummy in his cell bed and waited until nighttime, then dropped down from an 18-foot wall to escape. In the summer of 1947, Iceberg would finally meet his match when he met Maddie Cooper, aka No Thumbs Helen. Maddie had been in the life of crime since she was 16 years old. She was in and out of jail for assault, robbery, and disorderly conduct. At first, the two of them were a dynamic criminal duo, having robbed and conned multiple people out of their money. But when Iceberg tried to bring a second girl home, she attacked the both of them with a knife. And as the girl he brought home ran away, Iceberg managed to get the knife out of her hand and slapped her around a little. The very next day when she got home from work, Iceberg was laying there asleep and she started attacking him again and ended up wounding him. So he got up and grabbed a golf club and knocked her out with it. But even after the confrontation, they stayed together a little while longer until she got locked up for larceny. And this would be the last time that he'll see or talk to her again. Between the 1950s and 1960s, Iceberg continued his pimping legacy throughout Detroit and Cleveland, but by the late 50s, the economy started to pick up and females were able to find jobs to support themselves, so being a prostitute started to spike. Iceberg's pimping career came to a screeching halt when he was arrested for the last time in 1961. He was finally caught for the escape and was sentenced to 10 months in prison. This time, he finally realized that he was too old to be pimping, and on top of that, his mother was definitely ill with diabetes. He said that he couldn't risk being locked up not being there for his mother on her last days on this earth. Once he was released from prison, he vowed to let the pimping game go for good and to be by his mother's side to gain her forgiveness for all the bad he has done. He ended up finding him a wife whose name was Betty Mae Shrew, moved her in the apartment with him and his mother. But just after two months of living together, Iceberg's mother had passed away. Iceberg was sick with grief and looked to redeem himself with Betty. She was pregnant at the time with a previous partner, but Iceberg promised to help her raise the child as if it was his. During the next few years, the three of them struggled to make ends meet. But one day while he was telling Betty one of his stories, she grabbed a pen and started to write things down. And this will be when Iceberg found out he was good at telling stories. He went on to publish several books and be the inspiration for multiple movies. He stated that his life story as a pimp was told in a book on young black people about the dangers of being a criminal and to hold society accountable for producing pimps in the first place. By 1971, he sold 2 million books, making him the best-selling black author in America. But by 1978, it was said that the money had finally ran out. Iceberg had been living a lavish life, going out to parties, and hung out with other well-known pimps. His wife ended up leaving him, taking all four children. But in his final years, Iceberg played a vital role around the neighborhood, mentoring kids that came around and tried to steer them away from the life that he lived. 
On April 30th, 1994, the same day of Rodney King's riot in LA, Robert Iceberg Slim Beck would pass away at the Brockman Medical Center. Iceberg Slim lived a very disgraceful life in his youth, and his hatred towards his mother made him treat women like objects and not human beings. But after growing up and finally forgiving his mother, it seemed like he tried his best to correct things by helping and directing the youth to stay on the right track. And he didn't know at the time, but some would say that he was one of the origin of gangster rap and hip hop music. With his profane poems that emphasized and exaggerated, sexual nature took over the rap industry. And that will bring us to an end, my friends. I hope you all enjoyed this video or at least learned something from it. If you don't mind, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button for your boy and turn that notification bell on. Also, give me some suggestions on who you think I should do next. I hope you all have a wonderful day or night and until next time, stay mysterious my friends.